I say, you know, how many of you support the Second Amendment? Every hand in the room goes up. And I say, how many of you support Article 2, Section 26 of the Arizona Constitution? And maybe one hand will tentatively go up. And then when I read them the language, they're like, I can't believe. This is terrific. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Welcome back to The Kevin Roberts Show, still here in the great state of Arizona, and it is such a privilege to interview someone who is a real visionary for common sense thought, someone who has been really active in Arizona, and for that matter, in national legal thought, policy work for many decades, and he's still a young guy. Justice Clint Bullock, Arizona Supreme Court. It's a real pleasure that you would take time out of your busy schedule to have this conversation. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being in Arizona, and thank you for having this conference on, on education policy, which is, of course, a, an issue of great, uh, great passion for me. Indeed, and we will talk about that, both, both your own passion as well as the professional work you've done there to advance that great cause. But before we get into policy work, Justice. I'll call you Clint after that. I just Clint want to do that is once. great. Thank you. <laughs> I'm always curious about people's personal story. And, and I happened to learn just last night when I was visiting with your wife that the two of you met because of heritage. That is Tell absolutely that right. So uh, we, uh, uh, Shauna was working at uh, Heritage and I was at the Institute for Justice and I came over to Heritage for one of the famous free lunches. Uh, that uh, was on education policy, which was the area that she was working in. And uh, wow, this actually gets really personal really fast, but she was sitting next to the speaker and um, I uh, emailed uh, fo a few folks at Heritage afterwards and said, who is the goddess who is sitting next to Bruno Mano at, uh, at the event today? And her boss happened to be uh, at the event, she said, that's Shauna. And so we, uh, we met through Heritage. We started dating in DC. She then moved to Texas to work for then Lieutenant Governor Rick Perry. Uh, but we eventually got together, got married in, in Washington, DC. And she said, uh, within a year, we're going to move to someplace where it never snows. And that turned out to be Phoenix. And now she's a state senator. Uh, and I'm on the court, and uh, it's just, it's one of the many romances that were, uh, that were born at the Heritage Foundation. What a great story. Thanks for sharing that. Oh, my pleasure. Heritage has a lot of influence. <clears throat> what does it like to tell people the greatest influence we have would be over stories like that? Yes, absolutely. And, 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 and dozens of them, as you and Shauna no doubt know. So uh, another aspect of your personal story, which, which I always try to get into in, in this show, is how you got to do what you're doing. I mean, it, and I want to get into in a little bit the, the daily life of a state Supreme Court justice just because of my curiosity, which I presume some members of the audience will have too. But one way of asking this question, Clint, is in your wildest dreams, did you ever think you'd be doing what you're doing? Absolutely not. And in fact, uh, I decided to become a lawyer pretty late in uh, my college career. I actually was going to be a teacher and go into politics. And there were a number of experiences that I had that, that kind of tilted me in the other direction. Uh, but one of them was taking a class in constitutional law. And I thought to myself, this is how you make a difference. This is how you make a difference without compromising your principles. You either win or you lose. And sometimes, like with a case like Brown versus Board of Education, you can have incredible systemic impact. So I decided to go to law school and uh, ultimately uh, was lucky enough to become a public interest litigator, uh, founding the Institute for Justice, and then moving out here and joining the Goldwater Institute. But one of the things that happens along the line <clears throat> as a public interest litigator is you have to make peace with the fact that you will never be a judge. Uh, I can only think of two other public interest litigators who became 
uh, became judges, uh, and this is the only way that I'm in their company, and that's Thurgood Marshall and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. But the fact that there are only two I can think of just shows that it's, it's really the exception to the rule. And I uh, published a book uh, at the Cato Institute um, called David's Hammer, The Case for an Activist Judiciary. Um, an intentionally provocative subtitle. Particularly at Cato. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I remember David Bowes saying, you can't, you have to tone down the subtitle. And his ace in the hole was, um, with that subtitle, you will never become a judge. And I said, David, I'm never going to become a judge anyway. And of course, when I applied for the Arizona Supreme Court, uh, with I, I was Governor Doug Ducey's uh, first appointee. That, of course, was a point of, of uh, significant controversy that I had had written a book with that subtitle. So, so the answer is no, never in my wildest dreams. Um, I had never aspired to it or even considered it within the realm of possibility, but it has been a fantastic experience. So you were appointed to the court and then won a full term. And, but before you were appointed to the court, you had been at Goldwater, you had, had started Institute for Justice, but along the way, you also came to know U.S. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. That's right. You worked together. Yes. Yes. At the uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, he was, uh, he was chairman. Uh, as a young lawyer, I went to work there. We got to know each other. We nerded out uh, over constitutional issues, uh, both of us wanting to overturn the slaughterhouse cases. Only your most, your truly constitutional nerd uh, viewers will, will appreciate that. Um, and uh, just became very good friends. He uh, became the uh, godfather to my second son. Uh, and in fact, I brought him, uh, or he was speaking at the Heritage Foundation one time, and I brought my summer intern. By that point, I was working at the Justice Department in the Reagan administration, um, and I brought my intern over to, to hear him speak, and that intern uh, was John F. Kennedy Jr. And uh, that night, Clarence called and he said, was that the son of the president that you introduced me to? Virginia knew right away, but uh, but it took Clarence a while to figure out who, what, what intern it was that I was uh, introducing him to. Uh, so another another heritage connection there. So well, thanks thanks for being willing to share the the personal stories. I'm curious about the what you think is the the first big case or first big topic that you covered in the first part of your career. So there really were two uh, twin passions that I had. One uh, was freedom of enterprise, which uh, was intended to be a core protection of the 14th Amendment, uh, but has become uh, judicially our least protected right. Um, so I took on the cause of a shoeshine artist in Washington, D.C., Ego Brown, um, and uh, many other cases since then, uh, trying to restore protection uh, to the right to earn an honest living. And the other was school choice, coming from uh, my past as uh, wanting to be a school teacher, seeing how awful the conditions are for so many of the kids in our society, and, and being introduced to the ideas of Milton Friedman, and uh, I, I uh, I made a commitment that I would defend school choice programs if they ever came to pass, and, and eventually they did. On, let's talk about the freedom of enterprise issue. Since you got involved in that initial case, has the situation there improved or worsened? So it's definitely improved. Um, for Just to give you an example, uh, Arizona passed uh, licensing reciprocity for almost every occupation so that if you're licensed in Minnesota and move to Arizona, you don't have to uh, pass the licensing exam and that sort of thing. It's been especially helpful for military spouses, um, but, but for others as well. Uh, you know, we, we had such a, a balkanized economy in that regard. But it's even, it's become an issue that's actually um, uh, straddled the ideological divide. Of all people, uh, Barack Obama uh, got very involved in the occupational licensing issue from a very different perspective. He wanted 
uh, former convicts once they had served their terms to be able to get jobs. And these licensing laws were keeping them out of entry-level jobs. So uh, at the Institute for Justice, we made common cause with the Obama administration on that issue. As far as court victories, though, uh, they, are, uh, they are still slow in coming. And uh, a number of federal courts um, have uh, applied greater scrutiny to economic regulations than before. But uh, the victory uh, in the US Supreme Court is, is yet to come. But legislatively, it's, it's a much improved situation. So this is a question both about the particular but also about the general. And that is, on this, this particular matter of freedom of enterprise, given the legislative momentum, if you will, does that, both in your experience but also in, in, in history, suggest a greater likelihood that there will be an ultimate U.S. Supreme Court victory? Absolutely. And in fact, uh, Antonin Scalia had a, a debate uh, before he even became a, a, a circuit court judge when he was Professor Scalia against uh, Professor Richard Epstein on this very subject, with Epstein arguing for greater protection for, for economic liberty and Scalia uh, being very sympathetic but being much more guarded. And Scalia he said some words that I'll never forget. He said, the first thing that we have to do is to establish an ethos of economic liberty, and then further uh, victories will follow. And I think he's absolutely right. And we've, we, I, I think that groups like Heritage, the Institute for Justice, and, and so many of the state-based uh, think tanks have established the proposition that these economic barriers really hurt the poorest people in our society the most. And that has, I think, really driven uh, the legislative momentum. Courts don't like to do bold and risky things. And they would rather follow public opinion than lead public opinion in most, in most instances. And uh, so I think that uh, uh, those legislative victories are, are paving the way for, uh, for hopefully a, a litigation victory down the line. And it, it strikes me that there <coughs> is a parallel uh, with school choice. That is to say there's, there's an emerging ethos of, of parental freedom of school choice as we sit here 25 states plus DC have some form of school choice as you no doubt know 10 of them and we'll soon add another with Alabama are universal education savings accounts an idea that was born here yes in Arizona I can only imagine and I ask you about the jurisprudence to the extent that, that you can discuss that but the question really is I imagine when you were heading litigation at Goldwater you might not have imagined that this day would come <laughs> quickly. Oh, you're absolutely right. And obviously COVID was a, a huge driver um, uh, for uh, creating more uh, freedom of choice in, in the educational sector. But yeah, uh, momentum was very, very slow at the beginning. And interestingly, uh, education savings accounts came out of a judicial defeat. Uh, my court, long before I was on it, in fact, uh, I, I uh, argued these issues before the Arizona Supreme Court, struck down school vouchers under the state constitution. And one of the justices posed a question to the teacher's uh, union lawyer. He said, what if the money didn't just go to private schools, but it went to students and they could use it for any educational expenses? And the teachers union lawyer said, that would be okay. So we go back to the office and we're like, you know what? We didn't think things went too well. Well, what about this idea that ju Justice, then Justice Hurwitz, now judge on the Ninth Circuit, uh, Hurwitz was asking about? And that's where the idea of education savings accounts uh, was, was, were born. And um, as we thought about it, we're like, this is much better than vouchers because instead of just uh, focusing on, on tuition, um, you know, it, it provides for a range of educational opportunities for kids, including now micro schools and education therapy and, and 
literally anything. It's the most individualized form of, of education policy that we've ever seen. But it was actually born out of a, out of a legal defeat. Um, and that's, that's one of the, the mottos uh, that uh, I've always followed is there is no permanent defeat. You just regroup and you you know you try to try to move forward. And in that instance, it was I think a a, a far superior idea that, as you pointed out, is is really now sweeping the country. And and I am convinced that that momentum will continue. But just to geek out with you a little bit, policy guy to policy guy, <laughs> it, it it also is a model for how we might tackle the broad and expensive American safety net system. And to, to posit one idea we're, we're batting around at Heritage, although Milton Friedman discussed a version of this, something called family savings accounts, something that's linked from an education savings account all the way through retirement, through Social Security. And I want your idea about that in particular, but part B of that is, and this is where you know your inner libertarian may, may go a little crazy, <laughs> uh, full disclosure. We're trying to figure out what to do with the birth dearth and the, the, the social, economic, national security implications of a declining birth rate, and obviously what is the role of the state, whether it be the Arizona state government mm -hmm. or the federal government in helping to arrest that. We're not sure of the answer to that question mm -hmm. yet, but we're a think tank, so we're thinking on it. But w the vehicle that we're really enamored with is this idea of this sort of personal savings account that goes through your, through your life. Not necessarily asking for a, a legal opinion on that as much as to step into your policy mind and give us a view about where you think conservative, libertarian, right of center policy innovation is going. Well, you know, and you, you uh, noted my inner libertarian, um, and, you know, I, I think it's always important to fight within the realm of the possible and that to always be moving in the direction of freedom. So even if it's an incremental step, even school vouchers, charter schools were, were attacked as being, you know, not, not nearly as, as radical uh, as, as they should have been. So I, I have always been open to these ideas. And I think one example of that is housing vouchers that actually preceded um, school vouchers. And in fact, we often referenced housing, housing vouchers uh, as, uh, uh, as a, a predecessor to that type of idea. And when you think about it, um, you know, I, I'm sure there are a lot of uh, center-right people who would say, gosh, what an awful idea. You know, why would we be doing that? Well, the alternative was, of course, these massive public housing projects that were an absolute disaster that guaranteed generations of poverty and that spawned breathtaking crime in the inner cities. And the dispersion of people allowing them to, to uh, use their aid as they best saw fit, uh, I think is was a step in, in the right direction. So the ideas that you're looking at right now um, I, I think any, any incremental step uh, to allow greater, uh, greater autonomy is, is, is a step in the right direction. I'd forgotten about the housing vouchers, but those, those were huge. In fact, there are probably members of the audience too young to, to remember the, the <laughs> scourge of, uh, of inner city housing projects yes. and, and, and all of the problems that, that came from them. And it, I'm also reminded of the, the need to expand health savings accounts, right? This is the same kind of model, uh, vital part of, of great policy innovation. That's absolutely right. I, you know, that I, I think they, the medical savings accounts and, and health savings accounts are, are great, uh, a great example of, of that step. So we'll press pause on the geeking out on policy. <laughs> and now I'm going to ask a curiosity question. I've, I've, I've been wanting to ask you this since... We, we learned that you were going to be available for this interview. Just a very basic question. What's the daily life of a state Supreme Court judge? <laughs> well, it really varies from day to day. But as you can imagine, there's just an amazing amount of, of reading uh, that is required. Uh, the parties you know, submit their briefs. Our law clerks produce uh, research. So more than anything else, it is uh, either uh, uh, sitting at my computer reading things or uh, uh, reading vast notebooks because I am still a paper person. I'm with you. <laughs> good, good. Um, but uh, 
you know, it's uh, being on a state Supreme Court is, I think, second only to being on the United States Supreme Court in that our docket is largely discretionary. We have to take election cases and we have to take death penalty cases. But apart from that, we get to choose the cases that we are going to decide. And as a result, they typically are either uh, issues that have divided the courts or uh, super interesting and, and important issues. And so delving into um, uh, you know, the great uh, legal issues of the day, um, it's just, it, it can't be beat. And the other thing that I really love about it, and I know this is not uh, uh, true of all courts, in fact, it's very untrue of some courts, but the collegial atmosphere in which we work is just amazing. Um, we have, ha we have des decided some very divisive cases by four to three votes, um, and yet w not once can I remember a crossword being spoken among the, That's among remarkable. the justices. That's remarkable, especially it really given is. modern American yes. politics and, <clears throat> and, and discourse. And I love that. You know, my mode has always been persuasion, not uh, confrontation. And uh, so it really works well with with my personality and um, uh, enjoying even, you know, people I, I disagree with uh, being, uh, uh, being able to find common denominators and that sort of thing. So I juxtapose uh, my, my daily life with my wife's daily life, um, where, as I said, I've never, never exchanged a crossword with one of my colleagues, even if I disagreed with them. And I don't think poor Shauna has ever had a day where she didn't exchange a crossword. In the Arizona State Senate. Yes, exactly. Different ball of wax. <laughs> exactly. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a great fit for, for both of our personalities. And, uh, you know, I think uh, we're both in a position to accomplish a great deal as a result. And, and we're better off as a society because both of you do what you do. Oh, thank you. So what's the process for, given the discretion of the state Supreme Court, for deciding which cases to hear? So uh, it takes three votes out of our seven. On the U.S. Supreme Court, it's four out of nine to, to take a case. Um, and uh, we expanded, since I joined, I joined a five-member court, and it's expanded to to seven, and at that point it was three out of five, and we kept it three, uh, even after we expanded to seven. And we get, um, we get well over a thousand petitions for review a year, and we take about 50 or 60 of those. Um, and we look and see, um, you know, are these cases uh, important? Uh, are, they, are they easy cases that that the lower courts can decide, or are they are they more challenging? And I, uh, as you know, one one thing that differs between the U.S. Supreme Court and state Supreme Courts, the U.S. Supreme Court, everyone has experience in constitutional law. That's actually atypical on state Supreme Courts. So I I am the only uh, constitutional lawyer on the on the court. And so uh, when I see a case that, that raises a, a hot constitutional issue, you can be sure that uh, I'm going to be trying to convince two of my colleagues to join me in taking the case. Then when I end up on the losing side, it really, uh, <laughs> it's uh, disappointing. But nonetheless, you know, I'm always looking, state, state constitutionalism uh, is, is far less developed than federal constitutional law, and I'm always looking for cases in which we can uh, uh, we can vindicate the the, the uh, guarantees of our state constitution. What does the average observer, clearly a member of the audience, um, if they're hearing or watching this, need to know about American jurisprudence about the judicial branch? that they may not know. So really just picking up on my very last point, um, when we think of the Constitution, we think of the United States Constitution. And we, we actually have 51 constitutions. And our state constitutions were intended to be the primary source of our freedoms. Um, it was only in the 1950s that that 
that began to, to change. And uh, they remain uh, a potentially vibrant source of protections for, for our liberties. And as the US Supreme Court grows more federalist, in its decisions. Obviously, abortion is the one that, that comes to people's minds, but a whole host of issues are, are being re either returned to the states or um, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court is having more of a hands-off attitude toward, uh, toward state policy. The other thing that's really uh, important to know about state constitutions, we are free as state judges to provide greater protections for individual rights than the US uh, Supreme Court does under the federal constitution, but not less. And I have always called that the freedom ratchet. Um, so just to pick one example of many, eminent domain. Uh, uh, the Institute for Justice litigated the infamous Kelo case up to the US Supreme Court and lost under the US constitution. The very same time we were litigating in Arizona and other states with very similar cases and winning under the state constitutions. And uh, 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 gun rights, another, another example. Uh, it took the US Supreme Court well over a century to recognize an individual right to keep and bear arms. They, that was fought over you know, for, for so long. Um, our state constitution says there is an individual right to keep and bear arms uh, for, uh, uh, for defense uh, of, the, of ourselves and for others. That issue was resolved in Arizona in 1912. And uh, yet people, I, I often uh, speak at, at groups and I, I say, you know, how many of you support the Second Amendment? Every hand in the room goes up. Then I say, how many of you support Article 2, Section 26 of the Arizona Constitution? And maybe one hand will tentatively go up. And then when I read them the language, they're like, I can't believe. This is terrific. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so that would be the message that I would impart is the importance of state courts and the importance of state constitutions. They really, we call ourselves federalists. We, we love to talk about uh, uh, federalism and, and devolving uh, authority to, to the states and to the localities and to individuals. Uh, but we often think only of the federal constitution when we think of, of our constitutional rights. Building on that, are, are we living through a resurgence of federalism? We are living in the golden age of federalism. And this is true, not just on, uh, you know, w from a center-right perspective, but from a liberal perspective as well. Um, I, I think the framers could not even have begun to believe how important the federalist design would be in a balkanized nation of red and blue states. And we get to do our own thing to a large extent from education policy to health policy to corporate uh, you know, regulation and on and on and on. Um, and uh, so we, you know, from, from healthcare freedom to abortion rights to you know, so many other issues, um, you can move with your feet now more than, and, Trust me, there's a lot of people moving, <laughs> moving with their feet to, uh, to Arizona and to your former state, Texas, as well, um, because they, they, uh, they treasure the, the, the greater benefits and freedoms that, that those states offer. So a couple of final questions, big picture questions, although I would ask detail questions for a long time. <laughs> the, the first of, of the final two is, Say, pick a time period, 15, 20, 25 years. Maybe you're retired, maybe not. <clears throat> but no doubt, the two of us will be at the end of our careers. And you look back, not just on what you have done, but you, you're reflective about Arizona. You're reflective about America, and you say, you tell Shauna one evening, you know what, we got it right. We in the United States got it right. What would we have gotten right? What would have, would have been improved over that period of time from this point to that point? In other words, I'm looking for you know, some, some concrete thing, Clint, that <laughs> audience members can, can point to and maybe be part of, given your recommendation that it's so important. 
Well, certainly, uh, this goes back to, to what we were talking about earlier, um, you know, and certainly from an Arizona perspective, um, our freedom of choice in, in the education arena has, has just been incredible. And uh, when we moved to Arizona, uh, school choice was in its infancy. Uh, I joined the boards of two remarkable charter school organizations, BASIS and the Great Hearts Academies, which now are just, you know, they're national, uh, and they're providing educational opportunities to, you know, tens of thousands of, of kids. And just looking at that alone, nothing else at all, and knowing that, that we both played a part in that, um, uh, as board members, as, as a legislator in Shauna's case, as a lawyer in my case, um, it's incredibly gratifying. The other thing, though, is something that I know that you and I share very deeply in common, and that is building freedom institutions. Uh, when I think of IJ, we started with, uh, with seven employees and a pretty small budget. There are up to 165 people around, uh, staffers around the nation right now. I, 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 have even, I have long since lost track of the litigation organizations in the, in the freedom movement. Um, Heritage, obviously, you know, I mean, has just grown tremendously uh, and has increased its, its scope and influence. Uh, TPPF, uh, the Wyoming Catholic College that you were involved in, um, becoming a part of institutions that will long outlast us, uh, I think is incredibly gratifying. And uh, seeing, uh, seeing that they will continue to have an impact long, long after we're forgotten is, is about the, the most gratifying thing that I can think of. Institution building really is the answer. It's, it's more long-term yes. by, by its nature than many people think the, the knife fighting, if you will, of modern day politics suggests. And, and some of that, if it's legislative, sort of has to happen, going back to your comment about uh, Shauna's work in, in the legislature, friends' work in Congress. But the, the point is, while many fellow Americans, certainly friends on the center right, will agree with you and me, that institution building is important. They look at some of that knife fighting. They hear the discourse. They watch the news. For that matter, they see the deterioration of institutions in their community around yes. the country. And as you no doubt know, because some of these are mutual friends, they're very discouraged. Some of them are even despairing. And yet, I know you just well enough to know you woke up this morning hopeful. Oh, yeah. Why? <laughs> well, you know, even as institutions deteriorate and even as you watch so many people uh, who we would call our friends knife fighting with each other for no good end <laughs> in, in many instances, um, you know, we do have an opportunity to reinvigorate those institutions, people being involved in their churches and community organizations. Those are, those are the things that, that really matter. And where the institutions have failed, we live in a society where we can create new ones. I mean, just think back uh, to when we were kids, you know, how many TV stations were there? How many newspapers were there? Now, literally anyone can create a news source or an opinion source. And so we need to take advantage of that. And, and I think uh, trying to check our animosities at the door to the you know to the greatest possible extent, you know Reagan was uh, obviously a hero to me, and and the notion that you know someone who we agree with eighty percent of the time is our friend, not our you know not our enemy, and uh, uh, we can find common cause to uh, to build new institutions, even as as some of the old ones disappoint us. Justice Clint Bullock. Thank you for being a great American, oh, thank you, a great Kevin. jurist, and most of all, for being a cheerful warrior. It's been a pleasure talking to you. <laughs> Likewise. Thank you so much, and good luck at the helm of the Heritage Foundation. Thanks so much. Keep spawning those romances. We will. It's, it's a vital part of our mission, and <laughs> yes. America depends on it, right? <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> I told you you would enjoy this conversation. You no doubt 
knew of Justice Bullock before this conversation, but even if you did, uh, you know that there's a lot of depth in his thinking and obviously a lot of wisdom will take to heart not only his hopefulness about the American future, but the manner by which we can manifest that in our daily work. Thanks for being part of The Kevin Roberts Show. We will see you next time. Remember to keep your chin up. We are winning. The Kevin Roberts Show is brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. The executive producer is Crystal Kate Bonham. The producer is Philip Reynolds. Sound designed by Lauren Evans, Mark Guiney, and Tim Kennedy. For more information and to subscribe, please visit heritage.org.